a tech fund that captures the upside of the NASDAQ and pays a huge dividend that keeps on growing. Let's take a look at BlackRock's Science and Technology Fund. Now, in a recent video, I roasted QILD. If you're looking for tech growth and some income, I just don't think it delivers. So that begs the question, what's a better alternative? JEPQ is an interesting option, but it's fairly new, so not a lot of historical data. I covered what we know so far in a recent video. Fortunately, BST has plenty of history to look at. So today we'll dive into how and why BST crushes QILD. A quick disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just a retired investor sharing the research I do for my portfolio. I make these videos to give you some ideas for your own research. There's not much to say about BST's distribution history, except it's impressive. By the way, those two big spikes and the little spike, those are one-time special payouts. The rest of the chart speaks for itself, consistent and growing over time. Now, as much as I love this chart, remember that these are managed distributions. The fund managers know that investors definitely want to see a chart that looks like this. So if the capital gains aren't enough to fund the distribution payouts, they will supplement those with return of capital. BST is a relatively small fund, about a billion dollars, managed by a huge fund manager. If you haven't heard of BlackRock, you must have been living under a, well, you know. They're the biggest asset manager in the world with $10 trillion assets under management as of January, 2023. If you compare that to the GDP of every country, BlackRock would rank the fourth largest country in the world, just behind India. Now, of course, assets under management and GDP are not the same thing, but it gives you some idea of the scale of BlackRock's monster-sized business. They offer a lot of ETFs and mutual funds, but this isn't one of them. BST is a closed-end fund. And if you're not familiar with closed-end funds, the UTG video gives you an explanation. And it's worth noting that unlike most closed-end funds, BST doesn't have any leverage whatsoever. Regarding fees, BlackRock charges 1.05% for BST. That's higher than an ETF, but for a closed-end fund, it's pretty close to the average, which is 1.09%. And you're paying a higher fee because it's very actively managed, as we'll see shortly. The biggest difference between BST and most tech income funds is where they go shopping for stocks. For example, QILD's portfolio is the NASDAQ 100, and JEPQ's portfolio is selected mostly from the NASDAQ 100. By contrast, BST has the discretion to select stocks of any size and from any country. BST can also do private placements like a venture capital fund. So it's an extremely wide mandate. And even though it's called the BlackRock Science and Technology Fund, it's mostly technology. The biggest holdings are the usual suspects, starting with Apple, no surprise there. And if you want to drill down to the smaller holdings, you can see those in their semi-annual report, which I'll put in the description. Let's come back to those private placements for a moment because those are a big differentiator for BST. In simple terms, BlackRock can use its enormous network to locate and then invest in private companies and then cash out when they IPO. And here's an example. Think and Learn is an online teaching business based in India that provides education to 150 million students worldwide. BST invested 1.5 million in 2020 and less than two years later, that investment was worth 3.8 million. Not a bad return. So how does BST generate those juicy yields? A few holdings like Apple pay a very small dividend, but that's negligible. Most of the income comes from two sources, capital gains, which were few and far between in 2022. And secondly, the more consistent form of income comes from selling covered call options. And that means that for a portion of the portfolio, they sell the rights to some of the future upside. One thing I like about BlackRock is that they're more transparent than say JEPQ when it comes to their covered call strategy. It's outlined in their semi-annual report, which again is in the description. In summary, they write their covered calls 11.6% out of the money every 45 days on 28% of the portfolio. And by contrast, QALD writes their cover calls on 100% of the portfolio at the money, which means no room for appreciation. Bottom line is that most of the BST portfolio is free to rise and fall with the technology market. The objective for BST is a little vague. It's just a blend of appreciation and income from tech stocks. And when I say vague, I mean, if you're looking for a benchmark, there isn't one. 
In fact, BlackRock says specifically, it does not seek to track or replicate the performance of any index. So how do we judge BST? Well, I compare it to other investment alternatives with similar strategies. In other words, high yielding tech funds. The obvious choice is QILD and I'll compare them shortly. I'll also compare it to the NASDAQ 100. My bull case for BST starts with the asset management company itself. BlackRock's enormous size and its global reach gives it access to more data about investment opportunities and also managing risk. So if every fund within the company could share and then analyze all that data, it would give them an edge. And that's exactly what they do using their proprietary software. It's called Aladdin. And that Aladdin software has become so successful that they've actually sold it to some of their competitors, including Morgan Stanley. But BlackRock has one advantage over their competitors, even if they're using the same software. As the biggest asset manager in the world, they have more data to put into the software for analysis. Well, that all sounds good, but it's theoretical. So let's move on to actual numbers, the performance of the fund. Since inception in October 2014, here's BST's total return versus QILD. 205% versus 68%. And that's really all I need to know when choosing between QILD and BST. Both funds pay high distributions. And if you spent those distributions, you'd be left with an appreciating asset if you were holding BST. But if you're holding QILD, then you lost 30% of your principal. BSC doesn't have a benchmark index, as I mentioned earlier, but it's a tech focused fund. So let's compare it to one of the biggest tech indexes the NASDAQ 100 and take a look at total returns. BSC captured almost all of the NASDAQ 100's total return of 219% while paying a huge monthly dividend. And that works for me. Before we jump into the bear case, I wanna give credit to the analysis done by Value Prof on Seeking Alpha. It was a really helpful starting point for the research I did for this video, and it provides much more detail than I can go into here. I've been a Seeking Alpha subscriber now for six years. Time flies. I'll put a link in the description to that article I just mentioned, and also a link to get a discount on the first year of membership. I found it to be easily the best research tool and well worth the hundred or so bucks for a year. Before investing in BST, there are three things I think you should be aware of. The first one is asset erosion. Now during good times, this doesn't matter, but the fund has maintained distributions during the tech crash, 2022, using some return of capital. And that's not sustainable forever because it does erode the value of the portfolio. Now I think that tech will recover, but if you don't think that tech's gonna recover anytime soon, then it's reasonable to assume that BST will eventually cut their distribution. Under that scenario, Simply Safe Dividends throws out a rough estimate of a 35% cut, which would bring the yield down to roughly 6%. And my worst case scenario is a 40% cut, and that's based on the NAV falling down to 2019 levels of $30 a share, when the distribution was just 15 cents versus the current 25 cents. The second potential issue for BST is the private placement portion of the portfolio. Those private companies are somewhat opaque. BlackRock doesn't explicitly state the percentage of the portfolio in private placements, but I've seen estimates ranging between 13 and 30%. And you can identify most of those private placements by looking through the semi-annual report that's linked in the description. And if you Google those names, you'll get some information, but not as much as public companies because private companies just aren't subject to the same reporting requirements. Now, in addition to being opaque, they're also illiquid, meaning they're hard to sell. If their book value increases, that's great, but you can't spend book value, it's theoretical. Any appreciation doesn't turn into spendable cash until there's an IPO, and that could take many years. When the next bull market comes, there'll be an appetite for IPOs. But until then, BST won't be realizing much in the way of gains from these private placements. And last up, volatility. If you're looking for a smoother ride than the NASDAQ, then BST is not for you. Unlike some other covered call funds, BST doesn't really reduce volatility compared to the NASDAQ. When the NASDAQ took off in 2020 and 2021, BST was along for the ride, which was great. But when the NASDAQ crashed in 2022, that ride obviously wasn't as fun. BST captured all of those losses and then some. The dividends have been steady, but the price is volatile. 
When is a good time to buy BST? Well, obviously the price is down significantly. So the simple thing to do would be just dollar cost average while we go through this tech bear market. And if you like to time your buys, then you can use the premium discount price chart on CEF Connect. As I record this, BST is priced just over 2% above its net asset value. But over the past year, plenty of opportunities to pick it up for less than net asset value, which would be optimal. I bought BST at $40 almost a year ago, and in hindsight, obviously not great timing, but I continue to like the fund just as much now as I did when I bought it. And I accept that if the tech sector remains in a bear market for too long, eventually the distributions will be cut. That would be far from ideal, but I could live with that, knowing that they would grow those dividends again as the market recovers. In fact, if a distribution cut put enough downward pressure on the price, then the yield would increase and I'd probably buy some more BST. So obviously I favor BST over QALD, but what about JEPQ? There's a lot to like about JEPQ, including a huge dividend. If you haven't seen my JEPQ video, I'll put a link in the description. But as I mentioned earlier, JEPQ is less than one year old, so not much historical data to analyze. And for that reason, I allocated 5% to BST and less than that to JEPQ. And that wraps it up for BST. More armchair income coming soon. Below Neset.